you agreed to head north for Neverwinter and Mount Hope now, your party was optimistic. This would be the score of a lifetime. Not only would you be able to solve the small mining town's problems, bards would sing of your victory in every tavern and campfire from the forest of Tither to the Icewind Dell. You all would become Sword Coast famous. Hell, it might even be silly superstition that's plaguing the dark forest near them. You've seen it before in the south and got paid in gold and gems for what turned out to be an angry troll in need of some fire therapy. Two days out you get your first wake up call. When you cross paths with an elven sage who told you of the legend of the passage beneath the mountain that led directly to the Nine Hells. His apprentice tries to quell your fears by saying he heard it was just a passage to elemental chaos. Hey, heck. The rumor of dying in a year of a fire curse was just that, a rumor. You trekked on and reached a town to find it smaller than you expected, and its foreman assured you that you would not need to approach the volcano. The problem was only a short hike north. He would even walk half of it with you. He explained that the men would not pass a pile of metal and wood, saying it was cursed. Well, shit. You try to put on your best, I'm not terribly disappointed, and might choke this idiot face. You smile when he hands over a sack of gems and points you towards that said pile. You don't even blink when he hastily skedaddles. Your party welcomes the idea of easy coin as your finances were a bit dire. As you step from the cover of the tall pines to behold this pile of stone, metal, and wood, your body gives you the first hint that things might be about to hit the fan. Something smells off. Then you notice on one side of the pile it looks like a huge hammer is laid out. You scan quickly and notice the book endings on the other side is an even more impressive battle axe the size of a home. Your heart skips a beat as you ponder the magnitude of something that would wield such weapons. Then the pile stands. Warforged Titans come from the world of Eberron on the continent of Colver. Eberron is a world set after a great war on a world overwhelmingly run by magic. It was a contest winner from 2002. Keith Baker won this with his titled work, Thrilling Tales of Swords and Sorcery. That became Eberron, released in 2004. I believe he got uh, like 100k and Wizards got a world where airships fly and trains coast along a dark war-torn terrain, all by magic. Most notable and loved were the new race of mechanical sentient beings, the Warforge. What preceded the Warforge race was the Warforge Titan. They were created as living constructs by the artifices of House Caneth. But unlike their smaller counterparts, these hulking brutes are barely sentient. Huge beings of metal, wood, and stone. They are usually depicted with one large warhammer-like hand and an equally large axe for the other. Yet their designs can vary, being when they were created during the last war in Eberron they were assigned various critical roles. They could be imposing siege engines, they were built to wreak havoc on the enemy's army. They however have just enough intelligence to follow orders. Your basic crayon eaters, they will follow orders of anyone who's holding the symbol of their creator. So whoever is pulling the strings will sway the direction of the encounter. They are immune to poison and psychic damage and are immune to the conditions of charmed, exhaustion, frightened, paralyzed, petrified, and poison. That's poison twice I guess. They also deal double damage to objects and structures. Let's take a look at some tactics and gameplay. In D&D 5e, they generally have two platforms that can hold riders of medium or small size. They can be treated as independent mounts, or if not, I guess they can't use their attack actions. This isn't listed exclusively, but it's how I'm interpreting the rules. In the end, a duo fits the situation. The riders can attack larger foes with long reach weapons. Now it's written as knowing the language of its creator, but it cannot speak in 5e. However, in earlier, edi earlier editions, there were references to rumors of some that were given better intelligence and uh, some with the same sentience as the player character Warforged. 
I might roll with that if I was looking for a fun, unique game hook you know, for my group. You might even run it as the Titan is completely stripped down like someone left a door unlocked and uh, had the adventurers recover its parts to get it fully functional again. Could lead to some interesting uh, Thieves Guild play. They swing a mighty one-two punch that even Mike Tyson would appreciate. They usually lead with the hammer fist that can knock an opponent prone if they fail the strength check. And then they can follow up with an axe hand for an extra damage uh, if the opponent is prone. They also have the option of a sweeping axe strike that will indiscriminately hit all within 10 feet requiring a dexterity saving throw for half damage. Now unlike most constructs, the Warforged Titan will instinctively retreat when damaged to 50 hit points or less. They will fight to the end if ordered. This also brings in the riders and who's in charge. It would add some uh, funny back and forth if both riders were in, uh, were in charge and they disagreed on the action. The Titan would most likely refer to its original purpose on most orders, which is usually siege engines, so ground and pound the hell out of the enemy. You could have a crafty wizard or any other magic user in one of the seats slinging spells and an archer in the other to aid the Titan in its destructive stomp with the one attack it lacks ranged. In earlier versions there was an option to have one of its arms be an arm bow that dealt out a 3d10 piercing damage shot. Kenneth also developed some with one platform and the other platform was turned into a long rod in place. So the long rod would require attunement by a spellcaster and it would enhance any ranged spell cast through it. I don't believe that's currently in 5e rules but if you want, want to homebrew it to the earlier version, it had it multiplying the uh, range by a 3 factor and the area of effect got increased to 150%. It also had any spell that required an attack roll now require a dexterity saving throw instead and a fail would result in half damage. Throt also took one action to prime, one to aim, and one to fire. I might lower that to uh, aim and fire with a preloaded spell. This of course is taking away the five actions it would take to set up the rod, being it would be built into the Titan. There is also an option on design where you had the Titan be a troop transport, hollow out it, and uh, have it carry up to six medium sized troops. You would have to adjust armor class and speed I guess accordingly. Now if you hung around this long, thank you. Long rod that like button and hammer fist to subscribe. I'll uh, see you with the next chapter of Mad Dog and Coco's Misadventures and some more of our favorite beasts and monsters from the realms. And thank you. Thank you very much.